Coming up on the Men at the Movies podcast, we talk about war games. Even though it's 40 years old, we find familiar themes echoed in today's movies, like Oppenheimer and the threat of nuclear war, or the new Mission Impossible movie and the use of artificial intelligence. We've all had nuclear bombs hit our lives, these devastating moments that can give rise to futility. As a result, we become gun-shy, seeing bombs where they don't exist, listening to computer-driven hallucinations. Join us as we discover God's truth in this movie. The movies and stories we love are gateways to see ourselves and God in new ways. Every great story borrows its power from a larger story, the story that's written on our hearts and woven into the fabric of our very being. Shall we play a game? Yes, let's play a game. Let's play a game. Hello, welcome to the Men at the Movies podcast. My name is Paul McDonald, and joining me from Arkansas is uh, my buddy Mike. How are you doing today, Mike? Doing well, doing well. That's how you pronounce the uh, the state, right? Arkansas? Um, it's Arkansas. <laughs> it's, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm fine with, you know, however anybody. Yeah. It, it is Arkansans, though, or so I've heard it pronounced. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not. Show a, up for the movie, get a linguistics lesson on top of it. It's, it's a, we, yeah, we, we yeah. cater to all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are here talking. We're going to be talking about war games. Uh, it came out 40 years ago in 1983. And it's an interesting dynamic. It's an interesting concept. And I want to, I'm going to frame it a little bit uh, because recently I saw over the weekend, I saw both Mission Impossible, the the new, the Dead Reckoning Part One. What a, what a mouthful of a title. And I saw Oppenheimer. And we see the core themes from War Games, a 40 year old movie showing up in both of those very current, very, very well done movies. In Mission Impossible, you see the artificial intelligence, and I'm not going to spoil either one. Uh, you see the artificial intelligence. There's a battle over it, and they actually talk about whoever controls this entity, this artificial intelligence, this AI. Whoever controls the AI will control the truth, will control the world. And we, I mean, even early in the movie, they show this these imaginary ships and subs and torpedoes show up on radar and they're not actually happening which we see in this movie war games oppenheimer the whole movie the whole three-hour event is about the wrestling over the impact of the atomic bomb the creation what that creation brought about the ethical questions the morality questions of what happens by having this weapon at our disposal like i watched those two movies and then i watched war games and i was like man there is a lot of overlap there's a lot of parallels there's a lot of similarities so mike is here talking he i, I guess he, i guess it's be honest to say you have a passion for these nuclear fallout nuclear holocaust these nuclear event movies yes because you you've written a book on the ones how it shows up in cinema in the fifties and sixties. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've got a book coming out about nuclear war in, from movies in the eighties. Yes. Yeah. Which this falls into that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm guessing you talked about war games in your book. Yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah. I've always, I'm not sure why, but it, from a young age, I've always been fascinated by nuclear war and the, the apocalyptic dimensions of it. Um, I remember it when I was 10 years old, just assuming there would be a nuclear war by 1970. This was in 1965. Mm. I was 10. But uh, my interest, of course, you know, I've seen as many movies as, as I can about the subject. Uh, going to the 1980s directly, that was a time um, of, of intense anxiety on the part of in america for example will there or won't there be a nuclear war with uh, the then soviet union um and that actually is sort of the undercore of war games war games i really appreciate of all the nuclear uh war nuclear threat movies because it 
it's both a popcorn movie and it's an also a this could happen thriller. It attempts to combine the two. Right. And and also two two different genres. In the eighties there were a lot of so called youth teen movies often produced uh and or directed by John Hughes. <laughs> right. And uh <laughs> This movie decided to to wed the youth movie concept with a, a, a nuclear threat concept, and I think it blends the two well. Um, well, having Matthew Broderick in his youth, helps, yes, you know, before Ferris yes. Bueller, but a very Ferris Bueller character, he even changes his grade in the computer. Yes, oh yeah, I mean, it, like you're saying, he's not, he's not. <laughs> Unlike Ferris Bueller, three years later, um, yeah, we we see right away that yeah, he's he's a little bit of a smart aleck, uh, you know, kind of flaunts authority. Um, like you said, he changes his grade, and what was interesting is when he changes his girlfriend's grade after she's asked him not to. He does it anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and he goes back and changes it not from an F to a C, but an yes. F to an A. And that that actually, <laughs> I, I thought it was pretty good writing. This this tells you a lot about his characterization, a lot a lot of, about who who he is. Um, and he he is a hacker, and you know this was kind mm-hmm. of when that terminology was fairly new. Well, the internet was oh, fairly gosh. new. Yeah, as it, I mean, it didn't even it was, but you know he's. He's dialing the phone mm-hmm. and putting it on the cradle there. Like I remember my dad doing doing schoolwork as he's mm-hmm. getting his master's degree and he's got to put the phone on the cradle to connect to whatever he's connecting with. Yeah. Back then. On, on that level, yes. Of course the movie is, is certainly dated and the technology depicted. But uh, as you'd said, Paul, the actual themes, the AI theme, uh, the nuclear threat theme, those are still quite relevant. Uh, I haven't seen Oppenheimer or the Mission Impossible movie, but um, yeah, the, the, those things have not gone away. And I think that's what makes war games. I think somebody even 30 years old could watch war games and they might be <laughs> amused by the, because at the time it was state of the art technology. And e- even knowing right. that if you're young, I thought it might be actually in a way amusing. Gosh, you had to do all this kind of stuff. Um uh, but again, those themes, they're, they're still very much evident. So I do want to step back from the movie specifically in War Games. And there are, there's some really interesting things. It was nominated for three Academy Awards, which you don't think of with it. And that, we'll talk about that tension between the, the ther- serious threat of nuclear war with the vibe of the teenage teen kid movie sort of thing, the John Hughes movie, as you mentioned. But what is it that draws you into this interest? Why do, do you know, you've, you've done the 50s and 60s, you've done, you're doing the 80s. Uh, what is it about them that sort of triggers your interest that, you know, makes you want to dig in and find out more? I think some of it is the uh, implications that are worldwide. Um it's something that could affect everyone. It exists, and it's not going to not exist. You, you, you know, once it's once it's there, it's kind of like once you've let the genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. And <laughs> right. and after 1945, you could not put it back in. So part mm-hmm. of it is, and a kind of amazement on my part, even though I've grown up with nuclear weapons, that we actually have weapons we've created that theoretically. Um, could wipe out certainly a major part of the population and, and you know, totally mess up a, a huge amount of the ecology. And we have the ability to do that as, as a, a species, uh, but also even as individuals when, when we make decisions about, you know, who are we going to support, uh, you know, maybe politically, that kind of thing. Um, so, so, like, and some of it is just the spectacular aspect. There's just mm. a, it, mushroom clouds are kind of cliche, but there's a, um, for example, I've watched some of the films, the 1950s uh, nuclear war test films, and you did have some soldiers that would be in a trench just a mile or two away from a nuclear explosion, <laughs> and they would be told now, go, you're supposed to walk over it. 
And I've watched the entire footage of some of these. It's still there when when they come up from the trenches. To, and I thought the only thing that would get me to do that would be the peer pressure. Uh, coming out of that trench and yeah. seeing that, I'm not going to want to walk into that. Uh, that that <laughs> that kind of thing makes it really personal. It's not just some vague thing. No, I mean, this could affect me. This could affect people. Um, I... Uh, if there were a nuclear war, another thing that interests me, I, I think about what what would things be like? Um, mm. How would things be changed? How would you live? And when I say that, I'm, I'm assuming, let's say, that there's some semblance of order that still exists. Um, I wonder how from a mm, individual level or even on a civic level, uh, state and church, um, you know, one of the big things, and this is reflected in, in a, a few of the 1980s nuclear war movies. Let's say you stocked up. You've got water, you've got food, you've got medical supplies. <laughs> Nobody else on your blog does. Do you share your stuff? Do you do you hoard it? Especially if you have... Now, if, if you're an individual, I could see, which I am, I'm single. I could see that, yeah, you, but what if I had a family? What if I had kids? Do I do I want to loan all this out until it's gone? There are those kind of ethical dilemmas that I think we would be thrust into the in America. We don't have to worry mm. about on a day to day basis, you know. Bad, and I know things can be very bad on a number of levels in in the U.S. But but that would affect everybody, you know. If there were a nuclear war, even a limited nuclear war, it would still affect all of us. Well, and that's what you see. That's why the you know a lot of the zombie movies. Yeah. That, what they're they're saying is it's not the undead that you have to be afraid of it's the it's the people who are still walking around and living you know whether it's yeah. Cormac McCarthy's McCarthy's The Road yeah. um, or or The Walking Dead you know The Walking Dead are the in those movies they are the MacGuffin to drive mm. the plot you're afraid of them but who are you really afraid of mm. is the other people. Mm. We we stopped watching when it was the other people were cannibals and actually eating. Oh, the- yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like okay, that's weird. I don't want to yeah. watch cannibals. <laughs> uh, and that, that's that's an absolutely good point. Yeah, that, that does become. Um, there are uh, there's there's one 1962 maybe not to totally digress called Panic in Year Zero. What makes it interesting? Um, it's this family. They're going on a fishing trip. They live in L.A. You know, once they get far enough out, there's a mushroom cloud over L.A. and social order has broken down. The father immediately decides he's th- he throws ethics out the window. He he gets mm-hmm. food and stuff from a, a store they happen upon and just threatens to shoot the guy if he won't. In other words, he becomes totally mercenary very quickly. And um, yeah. And for a 62 movie, it's kind of frank. You have these two guys wander along. They obviously have designs to rape the daughter. They get shot to death, and you get that. You actually have a scene where it shows this couple that they've, that the thugs, if I can call them that, the three thugs have. <laughs> and again, for a 62 movie, pretty frank. Um, you can tell yeah. by the way she, everyone has their club, but the way she's positioned, you know what has happened. And so, like you're saying, it's the fear of other panic in your zero frame. It is. It's the fear of what other people are going to do or might do. Mm. So I, I think then what made it interesting to me is the dad just immediately decides. I mean, he, he has a teenage son who's, you know, thinking maybe he's going too far too quick. And, and certainly his wife does. So I, I think that's a good point. You know, it, it is it can be fear of not the menace but uh or like you said in a zombie apocalypse maybe not necessarily the zombies or in older films like in the 50s not necessarily the mutants but the other people who are you know still Mm -hmm. walking around and stuff and uh yes that that can (laughs) again and again going back to why does this fascinate me it and when I say apocalypse, I'm not referring to the Christian apocalypse, but rather um, a huge event that's just going to affect virtually right. everyone. That concept has always uh, fascinated me because it would affect every, like a cyber attack. Let's say the electric grid is taken yeah. down. Well, that's going to affect everybody. Um, there's that aspect of, of nuclear war films that I uh, 
that I plug into. Um, and it's kind of an unknown. We've never been, America has never been in a situation like that. So to me, it's kind of an unknown. You know, what would we do? How would we act? Yeah. You mentioned it's, it's the, sort yeah. of a, a brain exercise. Yeah. And you mentioned cannibalism, for example. Uh, <laughs> in the novels, um, you, the, for example, there, there are several nuclear aftermath novels in the 50s and 60s and they would often say their their focus would often be on how do you try to be ethical like one book considering a classic called the last babylon how do you uh maintain a sense of ethics given what has happened and I appreciate it. In fact, I've read that book five or six times. I really like it. It, it takes place in a, a, a small rural community in Florida. But I could relate to it because I live in a small rural community and have since I was 16. Um, so, yeah, I really, really plug into that. When we did uh, To End All Wars, with when I did that with Brit, we talked about uh, Plato's Republic hmm. and – you know, before this conversation, we didn't think of bringing up a, a Greek philosopher, uh, but it popped into my head as because of what you just said, what happens to society when the boundaries, sort of the social, the peer mm. pressure, as you mentioned earlier, to get out of the trench, what happens when that peer pressure is gone, when cultural norms are reset, when it does become a little bit of, I've got to take care of me and mine. Mm. everybody else be damned pretty mm. much and that's what that's i think why these these movies these books these stories are interesting whether it's a nuclear event or zombie or whatever you know pick your apocalypse mm -hmm. uh how are we gonna respond to that how are we going to live and because what Plato says is the main reason people are good is not because they are inherently good. It's because there are benefits that mm. it works out for their lives. People look at you more kindly in that situation. And that's that's what you have when you have the culture. But when it everything collapses, mm. you are going to have people who do what's right in their own eyes, as mm. Paul says in Romans. And that reaction and, and sort of how would – and it makes you question – how would I react mm. in that situation? Whether, I mean, I mean, you know, several years ago, there was the floods in Houston mm. or the hurricanes or even going back to Katrina in New Orleans. If that sort of event happens in a relatively small mm -hmm. scale, how would I react? Mm. How would, what would my role be? And it's interesting, you know, so, sort of like, you know, when we think about going back and living in uh, the Roman Empire and early Christianity, knowing what what Nero and what other emperors did to martyrs, mm. how would I react? Mm. How would I live out my faith in those situations? Mm. Um, how would I show Christ in that? Uh, so now we're actually going to pivot to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> <That we're, laughs> you know, almost 20 minutes in, let's talk about the movie. But I, to me, that's an interesting framework because, and it's also a little interesting to me because the first movie we did together, Mike, you, you wanted to do 2001, A Space mm -hmm. Odyssey, mm -hmm. which again had a huge AI component. Mm -hmm. And in War Games, in this movie, you do see again that AI component, but it's slightly, it's it's not the same. It's not necessarily malevolent. It's just what is that's what exists and we're going to talk about that in a minute but i wanted to, to talk about this first scene because it's the first scene really is what drives the uh the control of the computer it, it drives sort of we're like oh we can't depend on humans and this it, this is what sets the stage for the tension so you know you've got these guys showing up you find out they're working in a in a nuclear silo where they have control over a missile and in, you you watch a completely normal, everyday shift change. Hey, you guys are always late. Hey, how's the wife? Oh, the weather's bad, blah, blah, blah. Then they get a call that they need to launch a missile. They have no way to contact the outside world. And the guy can't turn the key. One of the, the, the team leader can't can turn the key. And, and, the, and his partner there is pointing a gun at him 
saying, we got the order to launch, we should launch. And what the suits, the powers that be, the, the, what is the, what is the term for that? The decision that they come to is that humans can't be trusted when 20 million lives are at stake. We need to turn it over to a computer. Even right there, the, the tension you see of, wait, is this a playful movie? Because, you know, they're talking, uh, you know, the, the banter back and forth. Or is this an intense, and it, and it is, you know, the guy's pointing a gun at his commander saying, turn the key, sir. And this idea that in a lot of these frameworks, we sort of, uh, we, we unplug our minds a little bit. You were, you were talking before about how the guy, you, I think, read mm -hmm. an, an interview, read an article about the guy who worked in a silo and said, you know, it was just work. I thought about how working in a hospital for several years, I, I would teach, I, I taught nursing students. And I remember one day we were in the emergency department and we, we, somebody came in who was, who was coding, who has had a cardiac arrest. So they come in and we're doing CPR on them, pushing on their chest and all this stuff. And we go to post-conference to do our debrief and there's a lot of energy in the room. They're very excited. There's like, oh my gosh, I got to do CPR. I got to, you know, use the the bag to help them breathe and all this stuff. And they're excited about it. And I and I was like, okay, that's good. Just remember, somebody died today. <laughs> like that's there's that tension. And because I know what it's like, you know, been I've done work traumas. I've seen, you know, amputated limbs, broken legs. Uh, you know, I've had I've seen dead children. Mm. And there's a part where you disassociate because if you don't, like mentally, you can't handle what you just saw. And that's what you see with this guy is I can't turn the key because I know if I turn the key, 20 million people are going to die. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very similar to what that, that guy that you were reading about who worked in a silo said right yes yeah he uh basically said uh you just screened it out you didn't think about like you said the the details 20 million people killed or whatever uh it was a job and you went to it and that's you know i said like his co-workers that's how they looked at it and like you're saying i figure you you would have to to actually be thinking about what this could mean oh my gosh that would be i can't imagine doing that in my, I, I guess like uh, the, the the real officers, you know, I, I would I would learn how to just distance it. But uh, my guess is they probably go through some kind of psychological screening, even though in the movie they don't. Um, <laughs> right. For that ver for the very reason of how do we know that this this guy will follow through? Now that could have become very lax um in, in the movie and of course as you said in the movie uh that's why that is the argument for why are we going to have a computer basically take control of uh our nuclear arsenal well it's because yeah. and I, I believe in the movie uh the general says 22 or one of the characters says 22 percent won't turn the key um whereas you don't have to worry about that with the computer it it it, it will just automatically do that um but uh yeah it, it it is and and it's a logical argument um but but of course the movie goes through what can happen or could happen if you know you actually did have a computer in charge of of our nu nuclear arsenal on in one hand we want people to do what they're told mm -hmm. in this scenario mm -hmm. right we don't turn the key launch the missiles we're at war but we also want people to think about the weight and the impact of what it is they're doing. Mm. And when you're, you can't have both. I think that it seems like that's where we're sort of headed today is even in this moment, you've got sort of the lackadaisical, it's a job, no, no different water cooler talk than you'd see mm. in an office building in a bank, anywhere you go. But at that at that job, they're also dealing with the weight of what will happen if I turn this key and launch this missile. Mm -hmm. And the movie balances that because it goes straight from there. You know, the guy pointing the gun at his at his this guy, they you know, they're friends, right? Mm -hmm. Turn the key, sir. 
and then you get the funky 80s mu- music that mm-hmm. sounds like a Ferris sounds like you're watching Ferris Bueller with the mm-hmm. the vibe of the music which to me I was like this is this is very uh this isn't congruous this doesn't mm-hmm. fit for me it felt as like oh man I, if I was doing this I'd change the music mm-hmm. I'd make it much darker I'd ratchet up the tension mm-hmm. But that's not what the director wanted to do, because you were you were talking about that, weren't you? Yes, and uh, yeah, uh, John Badham, the director, he did talk about that. That was a, a, a tension. Of course, the movie combines, you know, as we talked about the the teen movie with a nuclear threat film. Um, the, yeah, the director was like, well, how how much do we want to scare? the viewer <laughs> realizing a lot of the viewer because they're going after the the teenage audience and how much do we want to tr- you know try to keep it more like a popcorn type film and he said that was a tension throughout and as you say i'm sure the choice of music you are right, right. it actually is incongruous with what we had just seen but again, probably intentionally, uh, you know, trying to balance the mood between, oh, it's a, t- for example, when we see Matthew Broderick change his grade, go into the computer, the school computer change his grade, um, the, that's like a typical teen movie from the time right you know i mean nothing nothing uh very threatening but what's interesting is the the fact that he's okay with that his recklessness actually inadvertently leads to the the film's premises which there might be a nuclear launch because the computer thinks we're playing a game and it's not through playing so it's kind of interesting to me it's it indirectly it, it's kind of saying uh, you know there's the saying uh crime doesn't pay well hacking doesn't pay <laughs> uh he you know he he at first like i said may seem amusing you know uh his girlfriend ali sheedy um initially doesn't want him to change the grade later ask him could he do it and he's already done it um <laughs> and in fact changed it to even though initially she'd asked him not to that's all very much youth movie stuff um yeah. it does change gears when he you know get he doesn't realize he's gotten into the actual norad computer so there it, there is some tension when he and his girlfriend they just think it's a game what city do we want to blow up first las vegas yeah you know <laughs> and then the movie showing us norad where they're thinking there's actually a missile coming towards las vegas um I like that juxtaposition between what this is actually what you've done. This is what it not unintentionally, obviously, you know, Matthew Broderick, we know he wouldn't have done this if, if he did. But again, uh, by breaking uh, the barriers and just kind of flaunting them um, may seem, you know, relatively harmless. Uh, although I'd argue changing your grades, not really harmless, but I mean, it's, it's, fairly benign um yeah but it it leads him to well the fact he wants to get into this company that has these computer games and of course he's he, he he's going obviously not not legally the way to do it but again this get this actually his attitude i think helps launch the the movie's premise and you do see him trying to fix it later in the movie like when they're they have him in norad and uh some of the soldiers are taking him you know they've been they've been ordered to just take him away and matthew broderick's trying to tell them that joshua the computer program is going through with it and um and, and it's also a very teen movie like his escape from norad <laughs> i thought you know i thought it would yeah. be that easy in retrospect but again teen movie stuff you know he, he gets in with this uh actual tour group and manages to leave with them um i love the scene when 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 matthew broderick and and his girlfriend ali she are talking to dr falcon on his little island um estate and dr falcon is like no he's not going to do anything to to stop this what's the point um does it matter if it happens you know today or 20 years from now he's convinced it's going to happen and yeah. that did tie into uh certainly uh much of the nuclear tension at the time there were people that, that had said it's not it's not 
if there will be a nuclear war, it's when there will be a nuclear war. And so I thought it captured that really well, the sense of futility, you know, what's the point? Uh, but again, you know, Matthew, Matthew Broderick, you know, rallies, he's not going to give a, uh, Dr. Falcon says uh, at one point, um, extinction is part of the natural order, you know, referring to yeah. our extinction. And, you know, Matthew Broderick's not having any of that. And, uh, you know, he's going to persevere. And, you know, of course, Dr. Falcon, not going to give everything away, but but has a change <laughs> of heart. It's okay. It's 40 years old. We can, yeah. we can do spoilers. Well, so because I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the end, you know, the end of the movie or like the last half hour. Or so, because I, th- I do think it's really effective, though. I, there's a the phrase that you mm-hmm. used. Uh, you said futility. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think is something that uh, he talks about. It Falcon talks about futility as what's the point? We're all going to blow each other up. Mm. It's going to happen. It, whether it's now or in ten years, twenty years, does it matter really? And but the he used that term in another perspective of he hasn't taught Joshua, which is the the computer, mm. the AI. I have I wasn't able to teach him futility. The fact mm. that and he used tic tac toe as as an example. If you're playing with someone who's not five years old, there's really no way to win mm. because you will tie every time. And that idea of futility. In that instance, like because you had mentioned there was actually uh, several years ago this misinformation that there was a nuclear missile headed Mm -hmm. to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Some people found a bunker. They're running for their house. They're running for their kids. But some people just walked around as if nothing was going on. I mean, eventually nothing was going on, but that idea of that sense of futility of why can't Mm. stop it. So why even try Mm. to me? That's a way that a lot of us live our lives. Mm. We sort of live our lives waiting for the bomb to drop. Mm. I think that there's those again, going back to the idea of tension, there's a tension where we can live knowing that bad stuff's going to happen. Oh, I don't, I know, you know, people who say, I, I don't expect anything. I'd, because that way I'm never disappointed. If you keep your expectations low, then I'll never be disappointed. But then there's the others who who sort of want the nuclear war in their lives who will it's like, no, this is what, this is, I will fight tooth and nail for what is mine. Going back to the idea of that dad who broke bad, like instantly, who's you know holding up stores where two hours earlier he would have been Paying happily, he would never have mm. thought of stealing, l- looting a store. I don't know the the idea that I have in my head is our, our lives will experience nuclear war at some point. Something mm. devastating mm. will hit, and how are we going to respond to that? How are we going to are we going to react with futility? Mm. As I can't stop it, why even try? Mm. I'm going to get in my bathtub and just live the rest of my days, and that's. Because that's what happened to Falcon. His son and wife had died in a car wreck. And I think he he had that very futility of, oh, I can do all this. I can design all this. But what does it matter? Mm. Because the people I cared about most are gone. Mm. And that's how David, Matthew Broderick's character, was able to backdoor into mm. the NORAD system, into, into the Whopper, into Joshua. Because Well, that was the password that was the login name was joshua and he's like it can't be that easy that he would use joshua his son's his really his dead son's name as the as the key to get into the program and then that's how they sort of pulled falcon out is like if your son was still alive how would you react Mm -hmm. again going back to those thought exercises of how would we live in a post-apocalyptic world like how would how do we deal with futility when we feel like the bomb has dropped in our lives and everything is lost? I think futility is a very easy out. It feels that way anyway. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a good point, uh, and I like uh, what you said about uh, in in most of our lives anyway. Most people, there will be some kind of nuclear holocaust. 
it, no, it doesn't happen to everybody else at the same time. But it's it's like mm. you said, it's something devastating enough. Uh, and, and we know horrible things happen, like you said in the movie. Uh, his son and, and wife die. Well, and sadly, we know in real life things like that do happen. Like you're saying, do you uh, long-term just decide what's the point? Or are you able to work through grief and I know that grief is an individual thing. And like, I have a friend whose his wife died and that's still an issue for him, but he, he goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, he is a Christian and, you know, he, he still goes on regardless. So I think you're right. Uh, an apocalypse will happen for everybody at some point mm-hmm. of some kind. And and sadly, maybe more than one. I mean, you do have, you know, um, of course, to me, it's one of the big questions of Christianity. Why why did terrible things? We we know they do. They did in the Bible. But we're just not really sure why. But we know they do. And we know they are going to. I the the movie just sort of glances on what you were talking about when Doctor Falcon is talking with uh, uh, Jennifer and David Lightman. Um, th- he says that they're three miles away from um, a, a bomb destination, so that they'll they'll be vaporized. There won't be any problem. And, and said, you know, you'll be spared the horrors of being blind and wandering through. It's just barely glanced on. I mean, that, that sentence is, is right. It. Well, and it goes back to what we've sort of been discussing that you won't, you won't have to experience the horrors of surviving. Yes. And it's interesting to me that that's the only, that's it. Not even a couple of sentences about what that might be like, or, you know, uh, this was thrown around a lot in that time. Even a nucle- nu- limited nuclear war would, uh, and of course, I know you're in the medical field, but they would overwhelm the U.S. medical system, what, mm-hmm. even if it was like four or five cities. Just the from burns, uh, radiation, just all kinds of stuff. It would just be, you know, an overwhelming situation. So it, again, it, it, and I think the reason the movie, and I, and I haven't read this anywhere, but doesn't give at least <laughs> a couple more sentences, is to keep it from getting too intense. That tension, yes. right? Yes. Uh, and, and again, you know, there can be the, you know, let the viewer use their imagination when he says, the, yeah. like you said, the horror of surviving. Okay, probably most people are going to have some glimmering of what he means. Uh, even young people, because uh, you know, I've read at the time mm-hmm. that was nuclear war was a big topic for uh, for them. Um, of course, it was for adults, but uh, yeah, I know that you know that was something. T- there, uh, in fact, uh, there was a pretty dark teen movie made for TV called Surviving, and it's about two teenagers who kill themselves. Actually, it mm-hmm. came out in '83 as well. And one of the reasons they decide to kill themselves is we're all going to die in a nuclear war anyway. Mm. Um, so that was just kind of out there. I think if you were young, it, 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 it'd be interesting, you know, d- does the movie maintain the right tension? Again, the director in, in an interview, I think in 2015, he was kind of questioning himself. The interviewer basically intimated that he could have ended it with at least more of a hint of, cause it ends and everything's great. A hint of men is still out there. But again, mm. that's not what they were. They didn't want it to be too much. Um, right. Some could easily argue it's too little, you know, um, although I've, I've read review, several reviews from the time it came out. They were all very complimentary. Um, even yeah. uh, and I read some more recent Rotten Tomatoes actually has very recent reviews, like for 2013 on. Um and, and it gets 93% rating from, again, people from 2013 on. Um, but but I think there could be a debate about, it. does it soften? I, would, I don't think it softens the message of nuclear war, but it doesn't want it to be too out there. It's not Terminator-esque no. dark. No, no. <laughs> the, e- you know, yeah. Especially T2, yes. right? The end where she oh keeps my gosh, seeing... Yeah. With yeah. the playground and all that, like that is that is dark and ominous oh, and yeah. feels very real. 
Uh, whereas this feels possible. Yes. That's a good it, it, it yeah, I think the movie does come across well in that sense of making you think this could happen. And and then here's what you know the follow up would be or could be like. And I read at the time, of course, nobody knew actually inside NORAD what what it, what it looked like. Um, so they kind of came up just out of speculation, the 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 war room, and and I think it's pretty impressive. Um, I, I read a, yeah. one, one research review, twenty fifteen, and and it, you know, of course, the guy does say, uh, you know, data technology, but he did still think the war room looked pretty cool with all of its big screens <laughs> and stuff, and. Um, it does, you know, it, it is convincing, even though, again, I have no idea if that's actually what it looks like when you go in there, because nobody does. Yeah, right. You can't. Yeah, right, it's top <laughs> you, secret. You, you, if you get in there, you're, you're, it's top secret clearance, and you don't share what's top secret. Right. But speaking of the war room, I wanted to touch on this idea, because what they are reacting to is on a screen. Mm-hmm. Even in the beginning when they're playing and they're re- reacting because they're like, missiles are inbound, missiles are inbound. And then David shuts his computer off and mm. the missiles disappear. And and then, oh, there's two fighter jets coming over Alaska. Mm. They, they scramble jets and go to see if it's real for visual confirmation. And it's the interesting thing is as they get close, you know, Joshua takes off the 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 fighter jets off the radar and then puts out some bogus uh intelligence saying, "Oh, they're developing this uh stealth bomber that can project mm. you know 600 miles and they're like, "Oh my gosh." So again, but all their information is coming from a computer mm. who is actively working against them. Mm. who is actively working to manipulate them. And again, that's what you saw. That's what, you know, when I watched Mission Impossible, the newest one, that's what I saw mm. was that was the computer actively working, actively manipulating the characters in the story to to get to the end point, the, the uh, final spot where he wanted them. Whether that's in a reaction or an actual location or whatever it was, and I, I'm going to actually play the the clip because I think when because Falcon does decide to show up, he goes to the to NORAD. They bust through the gates because that's how easy security is. And then they're thinking all out imminent death, you know, hundreds of missiles coming. And what what he tells them to do to tells the general to do is is relax, don't do anything. You know, in um, there's a there's a I would, I just watched t- the Ted Lasso series and there's an episode where Ted Lasso is is thinking that his ex-wife is going with her current boyfriend to Paris and he, they're going to engage, they're going to get married. And there's a line that they use, don't freak out till you find out. Mm. And what we see in this, this movie, in this scene, that's basically what Falcon's telling the general, don't, don't freak out until you find out. How far is it gone? The president's about ready to order a counter-strike. That's what we're recommending you do. It's a bluff, John. Call it off. No, it's not a bluff. It's real. Hello, General Barringer. Stephen Falcon. Mr. Falcon, you picked a hell of a day for a visit. Uh, uh, General, what you see on these screens up here is a fantasy, a computer-enhanced hallucination. Those blips are not real missiles. They're phantoms. Jack, there's nothing to indicate a simulation at all. Everything's working perfectly. But does it make any sense? Does what make any sense? That. Look, I don't have time for a conversation right now. General, are you prepared to destroy the enemy? You bet you. Do you think they know that? I believe we've made that clear enough. Then don't. Tell the president to write out the attack. Sir, they need a decision. General, do you really believe that the enemy would attack without provocation, using so many missiles, bombers, and subs, so that we would have no choice but to totally annihilate them? One minute and 30 seconds to impact. General, you are listening to a machine. Do the world a favor and don't act like one. That conversation, that, well, it's more of a monologue, really, than a <laughs> conversation. 
But that concept of this is a computer driven hallucination. Mm. It's it's a bluff. It's what you're you're reacting to what's on a screen. You're you're listening to a machine. None of it really makes sense to go from a bright, sunny day to hundreds of missiles, all these subs, everything showing up all at once. But how often we do that and we're mm. like Russia, they're like, they're denying they're doing anything. Well, of course they are. Like they are the ones who would actually start World War Three because they are freaking out before finding out. Mm. And they're going to create that mass destruction what was mm. what was it you called it the 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 mad oh mutually assured destruction yeah much mutually assured destruction then you know joshua's they play tic-tac-toe he goes through all the scenarios realizes that no matter who fires first we're not talking han solo or greedo <laughs> who fired first who shot first it doesn't matter because both sides will lose Again, going back, it, it all started because he's reacting to something that's not real, mm. but it seems real. And I mean, as we were saying, you know, we all have our nuclear uh, bombs that have dropped in our lives. And so that almost makes us more, we are, we're seeing bombs that exist that aren't really there. Mm. Whether that's on our actual phones or the news or whatever it is, we surround ourselves with the doom and gloom stuff. Mm. And when we react, you know, it's sort of like that self-fulfilling prophecy idea, right? We, mm. Because we are acting as if this is going on, we actually create an environment where that happens. Mm. And then the, the sort of the final sort of thought is this, this idea of a no-win situation. We see the tension. We see teen movie. We see nuclear threat. We see, uh, you know, launching a missile. We see 200 million people dying. You know, or mm. disobeying an order or 200 million people dying. You know, in in those older movies, we see the bomb drops. I either shoot the guy to take what I want or I don't get what I need and my family dies. So like mm. these either or options where nobody wins is where I found that walking in that tension, that razor's edge is where, where God shows up mm. to say the... Yeah, and as they say, in some games, the only way to win is to not play. Because mm. when you're when you're sort of reacting to the dictates of the enemy, when you're reacting to the world around us, responding and not taking the time to verify, I don't have time for a conversation. Mm. <laughs> like you're about to to kill millions mm. of people. You really should have a conversation mm. before doing that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to say, does this make sense? Like, is it worth it? Is it, was it? And and they, you know, I thought that what they did was you saw, they share, showed that so well. Where are the first missiles going to land? Put me on the radio. Hey, guys, this is going to happen. We're here with you. And then that sense of relief when they realized that it was all a computer driven mm. hallucination mm -hmm. and the people were still alive and their worst fears didn't happen. Mm. Even what we think, you know, may, may be good information. And that's why we're seeing this or that happening. Mm -hmm. um, it, it could be that we're just tuned into one wavelength as it were uh mm. i mean the, and and, it, and it's what you said about the total faith in computers um you know we're in norad and the computers are, are showing that this is about to there are incoming soviet missiles period and you know that like there was the uh there's a quick phone call uh that satellites are not picking it up um, you know, it could be a mistake. Let's, um, blah, blah. But so there's more faith than the, mm. the satellites. The, the computer, uh, is, is like the final. Right. Uh, They're yeah. interpreting their life based on what's on the screen. Yes. Oh, there must be a glitch in that system mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this system is working mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. And you're putting your faith in a system that's broken. Yeah. And, you know, I think some of us do that sometimes. We, <laughs> we're convinced for, I guess it could be a number of reasons, uh, uh, a certain 
trajectory is the only the only way to go. But that only way to go, you know, does have phantom missiles. But we don't think they're phantoms. We think it's absolutely real, and we have something to base it on. Well, X person or you know X theory says that you know this will happen if I do this. Um, right. So I think that that's an excellent point. It, well, of course, I I think we still have near total faith in computers but probably more so since you know of course the internet arose in the 90s and we yeah. all have access to it it's easy to just be blase about but we have access to amazing amounts of information 40 years ago again when war games were made th- this would all be amazing to them uh right i, I mean just incredible whereas to us it's you know, it's not. We've lived it. We're, um, I mean, as, as you know, original computers were gigantic, and they had vacuum right. tubes. <laughs> uh, you know, it was so different. Now, of course, eighty three, yes, was more advanced than that, but you can still see by the, especially when David's on his computer, Matthew Broderick, the way it looked. Because I remember the the Apple computers in the late. Uh, 80s. I was. That's what I was introduced to computers on, and it, that mm-hmm. the way it looked on the screen. Uh, very. And I like that it be- begins or close to the beginning. You see David uh, playing the video games, um, right. you know, which was a big thing. If if you're young, that's that's one of the things you did, and you really did because you couldn't play them at home. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And and and, and, it, and again, that's something else that in that environment that was that was where you had to do it you know we talked about computers having faith in computers well you know i also had faith in in uh the news um you know the network and the local news because you you couldn't look up anything and and see what somebody else says or see if there's other footage or or whatever yeah computer wise we've we've come a long way since 1983 but again, some of those computer themes, and it is interesting to me that AI has, and especially in the past few months, has come into real prominence. Um, there's a movie that's kind of linked to War Games in a sense, a 1970 movie called Colossus, the Forbin Project. And it's a it's an AI computer, and the nuclear arsenal, it is put in charge of the nuclear arsenal. There's also the Soviet Union has a similar AI computer. Well, they meld. I mean, they're not supposed to, but mm. they do this anyway and uh, give ultimatums. And in the <laughs> film, I'm kind of saying, I, I think I give this away because it's a pretty obscure film. Uh, the, 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 the heroes think they've fooled Colossus and, you know, they're uh, dismantling or uh, deactivating a warhead on one of the. ICBMs to see if if they have if this if Colossus can't see this and th- then we can do this with all of the but uh, it explodes and Colossus tells them it, it you know he knew all along what they were doing he went and let the, went ahead and let them go that far so he could show them that they can't do anything mm. they have to do what he says resistance is futile exactly <laughs> uh, yeah but, and there's a really weird line in it um it, it now. It is a well-made film, but the, the really data technology. But to its creator, Colossus says um, he doesn't just want obedience. He he wants. Eventually, he said, "You'll come to love me." It's the implication is that I'm God. In fact, there's a a famous science fiction short story. I don't remember the name of it, but in any event, this computer is being created, um, and a uh, supercomputer. And the first question they ask it is, "Is there a God?" And the computer responds, "There is now." Um, <laughs> it's uh, you know, I uh. AI, and again, and, and you know, I, I like the way in war games that Joshua does talk to them. I mean, it, it, it at least gives the illusion of relating. And I've wondered as, as that increases, if, you know, are we going to invest AI with, I mean, as you know, it's it's all over. And, and I know that writers uh, and artists are afraid it's just mm-hmm. going to replace them. I think artists more than writers We'll see, but going back to war games, um, 
yeah, I think it, it is like the progenitor of where AI could go. Now, it, I have no idea if the U.S., if you know what I mean? I really don't know. Right. How, what what is the setup? Is it still in these individual guys in silos, and they get the the various signals? You know, of course, the big helping segment of the movie shows all that, and you, you know, you're told the. I always like that Tango is always at least one of them in any military <laughs> or science fiction movie. <laughs> that there must be something about that, but you know, you. Uh, so I don't know. For all I know, maybe some of it is is under computer i don't know well, like i said i currently i don't know how that or for that matter i don't know how it works in russia right w- one fear i've read about and this was long before uh putin became publicized a lot is that there's there's uh technology was kind of falling apart and i even, I even read back in the 90s that the u.s was concerned um that mm. there could be a glitch be uh, nu- nuclear or ICBM wise because their technology was not being maintained well. Rat gets in there, choose the wrong wire, everything yeah. blows up. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but you know that's uh, that's part of the the thing. But uh, I I do think uh, war games. I do think even younger audiences could appreciate it. Yeah. I, I think there's enough, there. and, and and you know I think it is is it is pretty entertaining. The pacing for 1980s films I think is good. I mean, as you know, I mean films from <laughs> in the last 30 years, especially the last 20 years, are are, are generally more fast paced, especially science fiction, because yeah. science fiction has basically become equated with action. Right, and right. That wasn't yeah. always true, but now you just assume if you say science fiction, it's an action film. Well, you know, uh, that doesn't. I, I don't know if you ever saw. Speaking of AI, the the Spielberg film AI. Artificial I did. I just, it's been probably like yeah. when it came out. So, yeah. Well, that's when I saw it yeah. too. You know, I, I think it brings up some, some things that kind of uh, bear on our conversation. Also, it's not really an action film, though. There right. is action in it, but that's not the, the gist yeah. of it. And it, it does kind of go a little more with, for example, the, the char- character and the, the, the boy in the film, does he have self consciousness? You assume in war games that Joshua doesn't, mm-hmm. but you don't actually know that. They never bring up the subject in war games, but like I said, the fact that it seems to be interacting with you, it even seemed the. Uh, and again, you could just say, well, it's it's programmed to, right? And and the language it uses is programmed to, you know, is ultra polite language, blah blah blah. Um, but it can learn. I mean that's one of the key points. That's that's how the ending, you know, they get it to not blow everything up. Uh, well, if you can learn, um, can you become self-sustaining? Could you become, you know, develop your own consciousness? I think it's only implied in war games, but there is that. You know, because that's what we do. I mean, it's not all we do, but as we grow up, we learn. And, of course, that changes us and it changes our our viewpoint of the world around us. So, you know. That term's neuroplasticity. (laughs) Oh, We actually create new new routes, new pathways in our brain Mm. as we Mm. learn and do things differently. Mm. But Right. Yeah. But that's a whole other conversation for a whole other time. Right, right. <laughs> True. So, Mike, True. Mike, thanks for being on here to talk about war games. Um, when is your book coming out? Uh, it will be out November the 9th of this year, and I'll, I'll just give the title. Yeah. Uh, Watching the World Die. I know, it's a, it's a really optimistic. <laughs> really uplifting. Watching the, world, <laughs> uh, watching the World Die, and then the subtitle is Nuclear Threat Films of the 1980s. But I think I can't say anybody that grew up in the 80s would, I, I'm not saying go out and buy it necessarily, but it'll be in libraries too. 
I think would be interested in it. Uh, if you didn't grow up in the eighties, maybe not as much. If you did grow up in the eighties, the other good thing about my book, like some movie books that are movie books, you can just turn to the entry on the movie you want. You don't have to right. like there's an entry on war games, period. I decided to do it discreetly instead of mix them all up mm. in chapters. Cause I thought that way, if people are interested, just two or three movies, they can just immediately, like I said, it, uh, it'll, it'll, I know it'll be in libraries cause the publisher McFarlane, that's their main customer mm. <laughs> are public libraries and academic libraries. Nice. Um, yeah. So I know that's where. And what are some of the other movies you, you look at in your book? Some of the other ones include, it's a little known movie called Testament. And the reason I'm even mentioning it, it of all the movies I saw, and I saw 121 movies, <laughs> nuclear threat movies wow. for the 1980s, it's, it is the best one. It's the most low key one, um, and and I relate to it because it, it's a rural community. Nuclear war happens. It and what I was saying. How does the this little town go on? Mm -hmm. It's just beautifully done. The acting is incredible, but I got to say it is a total downer ending. But the the acting in it is, and the music score is great. Uh, James Horner wrote it. He's done a lot of movies, mm -hmm. uh, Glory. Uh, Titanic, etc. But anyway, the day after. Now, th this is one. If you grew up in the '80s, some people in the '80s, because I've asked some, and they remember that uh, it was a TV movie. ABC put on on in November 1983 was really controversial at the time. I mean, now it's unknown, <laughs> but it was a huge, huge event at the time. There actually were a hundred million viewers. And that was when the United States was much smaller than it is now. Wow. So it was seen by a huge number of people. Um, it, it, there's that uh, Red Dawn. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to be talking about that Red Dawn next week with Sarah. So. Oh, okay, great. Oh, okay. I'll have to, when, when that gets online, I'll definitely have to listen yeah. to that. Uh, the Road Warrior. In fact, all of the Mad Max clones. Mm. <laughs> uh, I, because i thought well technically they are supposed to be now yeah. two of them are not after nuclear war it's a different kind of but i my uh what do i include was somewhat broad but i thought nevertheless they're saying this future is based on there's a nuclear war in this mm -hmm. so i i believe there's 30 mad max clones almost all of them italian made <laughs> um so for anybody that's the you know that has that's really into those um i don't even know if there is another book that that gathers together all the 80s films for mad max type stuff but but anyway that that's um uh, kind of an indication of of some of the other movies very cool well yeah so check that out uh we'll have links on the show notes and in our on our website, minutethemovies.com backslash podcast. And where can they can they find your book? It'll be available on Amazon or Yes, actually, yeah, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, practically all of the online sites. Um, so yes, and also it'll be avail available in Kindle, nice. which naturally is cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the price, I'm afraid, because it's a you know a separate publisher, I didn't get the select. Yeah, the they price, make the prices when you do it that way. They make the prices <laughs> themselves. I really have thought about self publishing because I thought that's one thing I could have more control over. Um, but in any event, uh, yeah, it will be available. It's harder it's to get your books available. in libraries yeah. that way, though. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. All right, Mike. Well, thank you very much for being on here again, and this was this was super fun. Uh, we'll, we'll get you back on here soon. I think uh, you mentioned Close Encounters as the mm -hmm. other as mm -hmm. another one, mm -hmm. so we'll get you on to do that yeah. one next time. Okay, sounds great. Well, thank you for having me on. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. And so this has been Paul McDonald and Mike Bogue talking about war games. Check out the movie. Check out his book uh, coming out November 9th. And I uh, hope you enjoyed our conversation. And I hope you join us next time here on the Men at the Movies podcast. Something inside has been awakened. I can no longer be who I was before. But if I am no longer who I was, who am I to be? Who am I to be?